Hi everyone, it's Roger and James here from the What's On a Disney Plus podcast. In this week's episode, we're going to be going through um, all of the news that came out of the TCA, which includes some new Earth Day announcements, plus a new Christmas show, which we really wasn't quite expecting. Plus, we'll be sharing our thoughts on this week's episode of The Book of Boba Fett, and also Marvel's Eternals, which dropped on Disney Plus this week, plus loads of other bits and pieces. Um, so if you haven't already done so, make sure you go check us out over at what's on at disneyplus.com. You can um, like us there, you can find us on social media, etc. So be sure to do that. You can also find us as well on audio platforms such as Spotify, etc. So make sure you go check us out over there as well and subscribe. Also, a little uh, thank you to our patrons and YouTube subscribers, but I'll be getting into that a little bit later on. And yeah, so there's been a lot of news this week. Um, it definitely kind of caught me um, off guard with how much news. We've definitely I think it's been quiet for so long in terms of, you know, the holiday season and everything moving along. And then, like, this week was like, no, we're all back to work. <laughs> we're all back to work. Press release is dropping in, which is great. Everything's kind of kicking off. So this week, Disney took part in the TCA, uh, which is the Television Critics Association Winter Press Tour. Now, this happens... I think twice a year they have a summer one and a winter one. They usually go on for about four to six weeks, usually with events taking place in Los Angeles. Though there's, they, I think they did them virtually this year. Um, so just generally is a time when they just announce stuff and they talk. Um, it's not open to the um, public or anything like that. But we did get a few different announcements yesterday. Um, some ones that we definitely weren't um, expecting. The big one that came in yesterday... And this one really caught me off. I just was not expecting this. If I had this on my bingo card, <laughs> this was not on it. Was Disney announced that they were creating a new Santa Claus limited series, which is going to see Tim Allen return as Scott, a.k.a. Santa. And he's on the brink of his 65th birthday and realizing that he can't be Santa forever. He starts to lose a step in his Santa duties. And more importantly, he's got a family who would benefit from a life in a normal world especially with two kids that have grown up in the pole. With a lot of elves, children, and family to please, Scott sets out to find a suitable replacement, Santa, while preparing his life, or his family, for a new adventure in the life south of the pole. And he's going to be re-kind um, re of connecting up with people that he's worked with on uh, Last Man Standing. This one, honestly, this came in, I'm like, really? Okay. Why didn't you announce this, like, before Christmas? <laughs> A little bit more sense. Two weeks later, I literally my wife. I said to my wife, I said, we're getting get Santa Claus. She goes, why are they telling you now? Like, why wasn't it like two, three weeks ago? But nevertheless, I think this is going to be a huge hit because the Santa Claus was so popular. It was even hitting like on the. It was one of the most watched movies of the of December. I mean, not just on Disney Plus in the US on streaming. You know, it was, it was a massive hit. But what did you think of this announcement? Yeah, it definitely came out of left field. Um, I I was kind of thinking, why didn't they announce it uh, around Christmas? I I think they probably just didn't want to confuse people uh, thinking mm -hmm. it would be out this past Christmas, yeah. uh, rather than you know an upcoming Christmas, and that that's probably the full thought process yeah. behind it. But yeah, uh, you know, I've never actually seen the sequels for it. I've never seen two and three, but the first one was great. I loved the first one as a kid. Uh, even now, I think it holds up really well. It, it taps into a lot of interesting uh story ideas and kind of getting a, a closure to this uh, or or letting a, another actor take over whichever they end up decide doing uh it's great this should be a lot of fun yeah i i, it, I think this will be great i mean i'm hoping they can get it out this year apparently filming is set to start pretty soon um it depends really on the special effects um side of things but yeah i mean i think if they could i mean the thing is a limited series we don't know how many episodes that is three or four you know, five, six episodes. Um, I think that would be good if they can drop it maybe, you know, if they start drop it around Thanksgiving and it runs through till Christmas Day. I, I mean, the finale, you know, do it on Christmas Day would be, or around Christmas. Yeah, it, it sounds great. I mean, it definitely kind of feels like, are they getting ready for Santa Claus the series to continue afterwards with a new Santa? But, or is this just the end of his thing? But definitely was not what I was expecting to be announced. It's also interesting when things like this get revealed, and they've not kind of been linked because quite so, so much of the time we end up hearing about stuff in advance, you know, through um, leaks and stuff. So it's really kind of like, oh, okay, this is a this is a big one. So uh, that's definitely um, a, a, a interesting series that's going to be coming. It will be interesting to see who they announce as co-stars or um, as the potential Santa Claus replacements if they do indeed 
uh, have mm -hmm. Tim Allen retire the character in favor of a, a younger person taking over. And I think that might be an indicator of whether they want to make it a long-term project or if this is just drawing a line under the series and going, all right, we told the story, hope you guys had a lot of fun, now we'll move on to other things. Uh, It'll be a yeah. long time before we we even get a hint of what that is. I think, though. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'll be honest. I mean, if if they do get it filmed like early this year, um, I if it didn't hit till next year for Christmas, I wouldn't be at all surprised. You know, if they if you know you only need what a couple of tests and suddenly then you can lose a month or two and then you 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 got a bit of a problem there. Um, but yeah, definitely an interesting, different, and just nice. It's not Marvel or Star Wars. Um, that's always a good thing. Another mm -hmm. as much yeah. as we love them, it is nice to have uh, other properties pulled up every once in a while. Yeah, um, also we um, also found out this week that uh, Disney are working on a brand new series based on Real Steel. Um, they're going to be working with 20th Television. They're going to be making it with 21 laps. Um, so this was confirmed by um, on social media by Sean Levy, who's, who's creating it. He's worked on things like uh, Free Guy and Stranger Things. He's worked on a lot of stuff. So they are working on it. I'm um, probably going to be a few years away, but it's it's on route. Um, again, this was it's like it wasn't officially announced in terms of a press, but the fact that you had then had them coming out, you know, you, the, the people behind it talking about it publicly, yeah, another another. I've never seen the movie. I realised I've actually never seen it. Um, it's not on Disney Plus at the minute, um, so it does make it a little bit tricky to watch it. But yeah, it's just great. Again, just more content that's not. You know, we need Disney needs this. It would be nice if they could come up with a new idea. It would be a little bit, but let's be honest. Um, yeah, we it, anything is good is if we can just get it on there. But um, I'm just having a look here now. Just trying to see. Um, I want to. I want to see where it is. Right, we'll still see where it is in the. It's not on any streaming services here because it was a dream. It was also it was made by. Um, uh, DreamWorks Pictures and then Disney like distributed it, so it's a bit of a funny one with that one. And it's interesting because I don't think it did particularly well at the box office. I also haven't seen it. But the people who have seen it uh, all tend to speak very highly of it. Yeah. So it, it gets good word of mouth. And honestly, if you're going to do remakes or you're going to do um, secondhand spinoffs of them mm -hmm. like this, I would much rather they do it with series that uh, were good but didn't get the attention that they deserved mm -hmm. as opposed to – um, well, we're just going to do Spider-Man for the eighth time. I mean, as much as as much fun as it will be to have No Way Home two in about ten years, when uh, yeah. nine Spider-Men show up from from the yeah. past, <laughs> the there are a lot of properties out there that really did not get the chance to shine the width they should yeah. have. And I really would prefer things like John this, Carter, real steel. <laughs> <laughs> John Carter. Oh, John. Honestly, yeah, I'd be fine with John Carter. Maybe don't spend three hundred million dollars before <laughs> people have said whether they want a John Carter movie or not. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of source material for it. They mm. should, I would totally be behind them. They probably view it as as toxic at this point, unfortunately. Yeah. But yeah, it's, just, yeah. it's that one. That one. That one definitely caught my eye. Going, oh, I like like the idea of that one. We also, um, it was announced this week that there's, um, Disney or Disney Searchlight Pictures have acquired the worldwide rights to legendary entertainment film Fresh, which is going to be um, showing next week in the Sundance Film Festival in the United States. And this one is actually going to be heading to Hulu in the United States on March the 4th on Star Plus in Latin America. And then it'll be arriving on Disney Plus everywhere else this spring. Do I have it confirmed? Obviously, that it will be coming to Disney Plus. Um, it's all about a uh, a woman who meets Steve, who's going to be played by Sebastian Stan, at a grocery store, um, and she's frustrated with dating apps, takes a chance and gives him her number, and they go away on a romantic weekend, and it turns out he has some unusual appetite. So I don't know if he's um, a cannibal or he's going to try and eat her, or I'm way off on that one. Um, but yes, I like the fact, again, this is I was interested with coming out to Sundance and going, ooh, because like what what's Disney and National or what's such like pictures of National Geographic and pick up because that's where you know they pick up these movies that we see later down the line, um, and it's great that it's you know this is what I think Search like needs to do is I know I know film people don't like to like to think of it but these movies perform much better on streaming for hitting a mass audience um, 
yeah, I, I'm like this. Okay, Sebastian Stan. So that's, that's it for me. Um, yeah, it, it should be interesting to see what they do with this one. It's it's interesting to see the wide range of movies that Sebastian Stan has been working on. You know, outside of uh, Winter Soldier, obviously. Mm. You know, a few years back, he did the uh, the Matt Damon Rescue Him from Mars movie. Uh, he was one of the crew members in that. And then, obviously, we've got Pam and Tommy coming up, and he's playing uh, Tommy Lee in that. And now we've got him playing, uh, let's go with the cannibal angle, the uh, cannibal yeah. <laughs> grocery store. Uh, th there is nothing in the press release to indicate what no. the unusual appetites are. We're just having fun with it at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, I'm enjoying the range that he's throwing out there right now. And this sounds like it'll be a, an interesting, quirky movie. And I also think this is where Disney can really like ramp up the movie side of what it's doing with like Disney plus internationally, and also just boosting up Hulu in the United States and shows you where searchlight can really help with this kind of content. Um, while Hulu is getting movies that, um, that they've got original, they're not tending to pick them up for worldwide things like sex appeal was the recent one on Hulu. Um, and I think, was it Mother Android? That was only on Hulu in the United States. And, but with this one, Disney Searchlight have got hold of it. Um, and yeah, so again, it's just different content, something a little bit different. So that will give us a movie um, to watch later um, in a couple of months' time. It, I just want to uh, talk about one small thing with that. It, mm. You said these movies do typically do better on streaming, and I agree with that. Uh, mm. you know, not too many people tend to go to these movies, even in, in good times. Mm. But you also don't need too many people to go and see these movies. Typically, yeah. the budgets are much smaller, so the return ends up being yeah. acceptable. And occasionally, you know, you get like a Blair Witch Project situation where you make this movie on like a five hundred thousand dollar budget, and it brings back seventy million in the box office. Well, or yeah. But, well, this actually kind of brings on to another one. Um, Searchlight right. Pictures um, also are they actually made the Full Monty, which is a very well. Known, I don't know how well known this in in the US. Um, here in the UK, it's, it's a massive movie. Um, it's all about a load of Sheffield steel workers who end up getting. I think they all end up they lose all the jobs. I can't remember what job it is, and then they're becoming strippers. And they do a big presentation, and every year all the celebrities do like a big um, charity thing, and there's a stage show and. Well, FX and Searchlight are actually working on a series now, um, filming later this year. A lot of the actors and stuff are coming back to do it. Um, so this will obviously be on FX and then Hulu in the US, and then that's obviously a star original then everywhere else. Um, so yeah, it was like, again, that was a movie that didn't cost a lot, but they made a lot of money on it because it really blew up. And that's where sometimes, you know, it's much easier to put out, you know, you buy five million dollar movie and if it makes 50 million or 100 million it's a massive success you know the, the the risk you know you're not like john like john carter where you lose you know hundreds of millions if you get it wrong yeah i was wondering why robert carlyle was up on your uh on the thumbnail <laughs> for one of your videos earlier. um robert carlyle for i think for american audiences we know mostly as rumple stiltskin from um, yeah uh once upon a time to cv series but i know him from uh, Formula 51, which was a really bonkers uh, mm. Samuel Jackson film from a number of years ago. Yeah, he's been in a lot of stuff. Over. He's, but, he's just very well known. He has a British actor kind of thing. You know, you kind of know him. But he was in The Full Monty. And I think yeah. um, Full Monty made a big impact when it came out here. I remember a lot of people talking about it. But I think it's been um, overshadowed by Magic Mike, which is, of course, the Channing Tatum uh, mm. male stripper movie that came out after that. And, of course, Channing Tatum and Americanized, etc. But I think... I think people in our generation at least mm. will remember the full Monty yeah. uh, to a degree, even if you're in the States. Mm. So interesting that they're bringing this one. Yeah. But I think also the well, it might be like, you know, like 20 years later of like, where are they now kind of thing mm -hmm. of like where their life is. Are they going to probably, I'd imagine get back together to do a show or something like that. Interesting enough as well. Disney are also working on a show called immigrant, which is going to be all about the creator of the Chippendales. That's going to be a star original and on Hulu. So again, you know, all these kind of different shows. We're really getting into some some really different kind of stuff now with um, the Hulu and Star original stuff. Um, also this week, it was revealed in some production notes for the upcoming Ice Age Adventures of Buck Wild movie that, uh, that one of the writers is working on a new Rio movie. Now, we actually knew... There was rumours of this years ago. I mean, we literally, I think it was... I think the last time we talked about it was like 2019. And we've heard nothing since, but yet the work is still going on it. 
Um, so there's, there is another Rio movie coming direct to Disney Plus. We don't know when it will be arriving, but always, you know, I mean, I think this is the kind of thing of for Disney to like use franchises like this one to get it in. Um, also, the, as well, in the same thing, it, it did mention that working on a next installment in the Ice Age franchise. And I saw a lot of people picking up on this as they're making the seventh movie, because obviously the new one coming in two weeks is a sixth one. And I'm a little bit like, well, do they mean the like the next one is the one that we're getting in two weeks or the one or is the one after that? So I was, I, that's why I didn't necessarily run with like there being a seventh movie, because like, well, I read that slightly different to a lot of other people. So it's a little bit like, well, the next one's not out yet. So that is the next one. <laughs> so does that make sense? <laughs> It, it makes sense. I would probably go with the read that they are indeed working on another one afterwards. Because, yeah. like, at this point with Buckwild coming out, what, two weeks? Yeah. Uh, in, in, at least in the States. So yeah. Not going into the weird release calendar. Um, they're probably done working on it. Yeah. You know, the, there might be some post editing still doing. They might mm. have, like, a special effects shot or two that still need to be, like, spliced in because they're, they're mm. still rendering. But functionally, like, 99% of the staff is not working on this movie anymore. So normally when they say working on it, my guess would be it'd be the next one, but they also didn't specify that it's a movie. Yeah, um, but also and, as well, I mean, we don't know how long those production notes have been sat, uh, written, so they might have been, that's yeah, they could true. have been sat around for a couple of months waiting to go. It's just it's just one of the things, there, there could be another one, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if there is another Ice Age movie, but I did see this one floating around the hemisphere and going, well, it depends on how you read read it. I wouldn't be at all surprised. I I definitely feel it. depends how Ice Age does, I think, a new one. I mean, Ice Age is the new Land Before Time series. They're going to have, like, a bajillion uh, movies Mm. that nobody asked for. Yes. And we'll be talking about that movie in two weeks when it drops Mm. onto Disney Plus um, in most places. Right, let's now talk about some other stuff that got announced at the TCA. So um, we got a new trailer for the uh, the Proud Family, Pr- Louder and Prouder, a new animated series dropping um, on the 23rd of February, new episodes dropping weekly, 10 episodes. It also stated in the in the sort of official document stuff that it was weekly. So that will then ride us through until um, end of April. And now I'm going to be honest, I've never seen the Proud Family, so it's a little bit like... I watched the trailers like so. I'm going to be coming into this a little bit. Um, again, Disney Channel, like I think it's, it's it's like a continuation of a Disney Channel animated show of about three or four years later. So the characters are all a little bit older, but it is a continuation. A lot of the original cast are coming back, lots of special guests. Um, it's kind of one of those things I feel like I probably need to watch maybe the movie or something like that to kind of get up to speed before it drops drops onto Disney Plus next month. But it's going to be that's going to be a big series. I know a lot of um. A lot of people are excited about it. I also think as well, um, obviously like here in the UK, I don't think even, I don't know, I think the Disney Channel didn't even exist here in the UK when this <laughs> came out. So, <laughs> and I would have been like 20, so I was nowhere near like watching it at the time. But yeah, I'm the trailer looks fun. I'm, I'm, I, I, in some ways I can come into this, no, I'm come, I want, I'm thinking, well, I'm, should I just wait and what's come in on this new series? Like going, no, I'm coming in fresh, you know, treat me like I'm a new, you know, will that work? It, you know, it might work, it might not. But <laughs> So I've also never seen uh, the original series, but this trailer actually pushed me to the point where I'm, all right, the next, uh, the next series that I'm going to watch will probably be the original mm. uh, Proud Family, because this trailer was great. I, mm. I thought it was hilarious. Uh, so, I, yeah, I'm in the same boat. I, I kind of want to watch this in advance of uh, the mm. new series and get caught up on it. Uh, yeah, once I finish up with uh, with what I'm watching now, I think that's that's next in line. Yes, there's, there's so much. There's so much television on right now. It's like they're just dropping. So I mean, I'm watching. I, I'm thinking just off the top of my head. I'm watching like The Tourist, Death in Paradise. I've just started watching Afterlife last night on Netflix. Um, I, yeah, just loads of loads of great shows. Um, Around the World in 80 Days, the Phileas Fogg one. Um, I think it's on PBS in the US. That's, that's a fun little series. But yeah, just loads of stuff at this time of the year. Um, shifting gears now over to um, National Geographic and Earth Day. So this is taking place on uh, Friday, April the 22nd. Disney has confirmed um, a movie and two specials are going to be coming our way on that Friday. Um, obviously, they, you know, they do love Earth Day. It fits in with National Geographic and the Animal Kingdom and generally just being, you know, nice to the environment. So we're getting Polar Bear, which is the next adventure uh, from the Disney Nature. 
So this one is going to be um, narrated by um, Catherine Keener and basically it tells the story of a new mother whose memories of her, her own youth prepare to navigate motherhood in an increasingly challenging world that polar, ba polar bears face today. Yeah, this is going to be more stuff from, uh, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to look amazing. You know, you know that it's going to just look stunning, but we all, we always know with the, uh, Disney nature, it's the narration that does it for us older viewers. But I'm sure this will be a, another big hit. I'm sure it'll be a hit. And like you said, I'm sure the photography will be, be beautiful, especially if they're you know, just from the stills that they're showing mm. right there. Uh, the description of it does worry me a little bit, where they're they're putting in this narrative of the of the polar bear mother remembering her own childhood. I'm just like, uh, oh, sure. Just, just tell us about the polar bears. I don't need the narrative for this. But as you said, that is kind of the Disney nature um, yeah. thing is to do these kind of, uh, yeah, kitty. Uh, but they need them. There is, there is, there is a, there is. A, they, you know, we do know. need them. You know, younger audiences to watch it to fall in love with these documentaries, and then then they move on to the more you know, like bigger stuff like we're getting now, like with the Green Planet, for example, on the BBC here right now. Um, you know. This is this is a perfect way way to get in there. Nice as well that Disney Nature is continuing because I did wonder what was going to happen, you know. And I feel like Disney Plus is the natural home for it because they generally generally never perform very well at the cinema because of the type of movie it is, and they don't tend to have an inter, a big international release. I think Disney Plus is the perfect place for, you know, if we get a Disney Nature movie every Earth Day, I think that would be a, a great op opportunity. I'd be down for it, uh, especially if they explore a widely different. You know, types of animals over the years in different parts of the planet. I can't remember. Did we get Dover Reef and Elephant last year, or was it the year before? I believe that was the year before. Yeah. See, the, again, they should have held one back rather than do two at once. Drop, <laughs> drop, drop them like that. But um, yeah, so we were a little bit like, uh, but I must admit, we did enjoy the uh, behind the scenes documentaries that they did alongside them. So hopefully, we get that again, where you know they they kind of show us how they did it. Um, also, we got um, a new special called the. No, I, I never actually. I don't think I ever saw the first one. Was the biggest, the biggest little farm, the return. So this is going to be a special, and and it's a kind of a follow on from the 2018 award winning feature documentary that tells the lives of John and Molly, who abandoned their urban life in Los Angeles to live on a barren farm to grow food in harmony with nature in Ventura Country. Uh, so this is a like what's happened in the 10 years um in the 10 year transformation of this place um i mean it's about a farm i mean i'm gonna be i watch thing i watch country file every week so i love all this stuff you know i'm i'm up in the fields and stuff with the dogs regularly so this looks nice i mean you got you know, pigs and cows and all kinds of things yeah looks nice <laughs> The obligatory uh, shot of the farmer holding soil in a meaningful way. Yeah. Yes, yes, and the areas with a pig. You know, it's it's just a basic stuff. So again, yeah, that's a big pig. You get a lot of bacon out of that. Um, so there's definitely. <laughs> um, you also get. Um, there's another special coming on the same day. This is called Explorer: The Last um, Two Pie. I think that's, it. that's how you. I'm not quite sure how. I you quite it is Tepui, but I'm not Tepui, sure. Yeah. I honestly don't know. Yes, yeah, so again, this is coming on Earth Day on Friday, April the 22nd. So this is following the climber Alex, who you might know from a Free Solo, and his team as they uh, go on a grueling mission deep inside the Amazon jungle as they attempt to first ascend a climb of over a thousand sheer foot cliff. Their goal is to deliver um, the biologist and explorer Bruce Means to the top of a massive island in the sky. Um, team must first trek through the jungle to get there so i guess this is gonna be a special they actually announced this one hour special uh, i think it was a year ago and there's some other specials that they're doing so it looks like what they're going to be doing with this is kind of turning them into little events rather than releasing them like a series which makes a lot of sense but explorer has been going along in national geographic as a series for years um so they're kind of bringing it back as a special nice to see these announced um yeah it's it's the fact earth day in in April was not quite on my thing I thought we'd talk about yet. I thought we you know, might have been a little bit get some stuff what's coming in February. But yes, yeah, so a couple of nice things there being announced for April. Yeah, I think last year they really saved the announcements up until like the week before Earth Day. We might have had a couple of weeks. That was about it. Yeah. Well, last so year it, was a little, yeah, last year's Earth Day was a little bit more hit and miss. But the, the thing is, at last year's TCA award, um, event, 
Disney announced like five months worth of Disney Plus. They announced a release date of um, Turner and Hooch. Uh, I think it was like Loki. You know, they announced the whole summer's event of stuff. Mysterious Benedict Society, The Bad Batch. They announced all the dates. So we knew then for the whole rest of the summer when everything was coming out. And there's a lot of expectation like going into this week's event. Of, they're going to announce everything that's coming for the next three, four months. And then like the night before, they were like, no, we're going to be talking about the Book of Boba Fett, Proud Family, and Earth Day. I'm like, okay, trying to get everyone. And yesterday, everyone was going nuts on the internet about moon date dates. And I'm just like, well, nothing's official yet. You know, these are just dates that are just floating around the internet. So there was a little bit of a kind of pushback. And they were like, oh, well, they didn't announce what, you know, you know be, well, the trouble is, it's like, just because they did it last year, but the trouble is with last year, they ended up changing nearly all the dates anyway. So, And then we found since Disney Plus Day, how many dates have changed since they were announced at Disney Plus Day with, like, Sneakerella, we've got um, Turning Red, you know, there's been a whole host of stuff that's changed. So while I would have loved to have had, like, an outline of what we're getting over the next six months, if Disney are just going to change it all anyway, there's not a lot of point. They might as well just wait until they've got it. <laughs> Well, it's interesting because actually a lot of times if you announce a date, people tend to be happy with it. They know they can look yeah. forward to it. And even if you have to change it later, you know, mm. um, delays for whatever. We see it in video games all the time, of yeah. course. You know, uh, production is falling behind, so we change it. I think that, that even though there is some negativity mm. whenever that happens, people will complain, oh, I, I didn't get my movie, I didn't get my game when I was expecting to. I think that there's more goodwill generated by having a date, even if you have to change it, than by just going, it's uh, it's over here, well, uh, I, right before fall, sometime right before fall. See, I kind of look at it the other way, because I was thinking of this last night, going, I'm thinking, like, here in the UK, like, the BBC don't tend to announce any like dates until literally until you're into the month or the week before it. Um, they might say it's coming this fall or coming this spring or something when they start rolling adverts. But they don't tend to announce, uh, most of the channels here do not announce stuff that far in advance. They, It's very much along the lines of when they're telling you it's it might be coming soon is one thing. But then when it's like, here is the date, it is literally like, oh, it's coming like next week. You know, there's a, and I don't know, like, like with ABC over there in the US or with other ones, I know Netflix has a tendency sometimes to put dates out a little bit more. But I'm like, well, actually in tra traditional television, do they do that? I mean, I know in the US... We tend to get a lot of long-standing shows, which just run and run and run. Where we get, you know, we're more much more used to these limited series. And I don't know. I was just thinking, going, well, actually, yeah, I don't think any of our channels here really announce stuff that far in advance. No, I, I think it is a, a cultural thing, and we typically do announce things much farther out. In fact, uh, normally, you know, we do things, of course, seasonally with the mm. the. So you'll do like the fall lineup, the winter lineup of um, ABC or NBC or any of those things they're normally several months in advance and they'll be mm -hmm. like, okay, uh, these are the returning series and this is the start date for each returning series. And these are uh, the new series and here's the start date and here's the specials. Um, and the, these are the days of special. Yeah. And you normally know several months in advance in yeah. the States what to expect. Um, it might be a volume thing where we have so many channels that you need to get people hyped for stuff early or else it's just going to slip through the cracks. Mm. Uh, that's one possibility. There's there's plenty of others you could explore. But yeah, in the States, typically we do know much farther in advance. Mm. Okay, this starts on January 30th. So even though it's November something right now, yeah. I need to mark this on my calendar because this is something I want to see. Obviously, it's a bit less important when it's streaming. All I need to know is the date it's going to come out rather than when yeah. it's airing because I can see it whenever. Uh, but I think that cultural aspect is still there. Yeah, it's it's, it's funny because I was just because it was just really that kind of thing. Where I was like comparing it to other stations and other. And I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, like in television, especially over here, it's everything's generally kept much closer to their chests of when they announce stuff. And I actually don't think that's a bad a bad thing. Sometimes it's better, like especially with Disney lately, because they've been they've been pretty bad at this of just announcing dates and then changing them and it's like to me it's like don't don't give us a date until you are a hundred percent on it you know um and then you know you usually might get that announcement oh we're going to drop two episodes at once or something like that a little bit later on but it's like i don't know i mean we're actually we're actually finding a trend over here now in the uk um there's quite a few shows i've started watching over the holiday like the tourist uh phileas fog and the uh, screw 
where what they do is they now put the whole season up online on demand and then they're still releasing the episodes weekly lois and clark was another sorry not lois and clark lois and superman was another series where they're releasing them weekly on the television but they actually put them up on their on demand system and all at once so you kind of get the best of both worlds there if you want to but again it's it's all very last minute over here and i and maybe i was just i sort of sort of as long as you know as long as i know what's coming next month or the next couple of weeks it doesn't really matter and i don't know i it might just be a cultural thing of just like like i said i've, I've suddenly almost like I'm, i don't yeah i don't have this with anybody <laughs> it's just, just how it is i i think the the stations in america are, are in a much fiercer competition with each other so there's a lot of um need to show what your content is going to be coming up to show i don't know you should be tuned into abc because look at our lineup and the nbc lineup is just not nearly as good or you know and it, it changes season to season who's got the, the quote unquote good lineup um but yeah uh it's an interesting thing. I never even really thought about that but no it, yeah as, as an american yeah. just like yeah we, we know about stuff like months in advance and if they push it back well yeah it happens yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it was just kind of because obviously, like with movies, we're very much aware with movies of everything having its release date, and a big thing gets made every time it gets delayed or everything like that. And as I said, video games are used to it, but it was television was like, mm, there's a, but then again, I think television's been so splintered for so long. It's you know, every country would get stuff differently. You know, you could never rely on you know, you know, like Peacemaker right now. I can't even watch it here in the UK, it's not out, you know, for, for us to watch, it's they don't even know it's going to arrive. We're arriving somewhere, but we don't know where. And it's that kind of thing of you never knew which channel it was going to be. Generally, with the streamers, we're starting to get a little bit better because, you know, if a Netflix show is out, like after life dropped yesterday, you know it's everywhere. So it's a much easier system to do, and which I really want Disney to get more into. Yeah. You know, when you drop an episode in the US, drop it everywhere. You know, give it yeah, to us all good. at the same time rather than, like, we're just getting Queens, I think, ne next week. I mean, that's been out since, like, September in the U.S., and it's just annoying. <laughs> and uh, you've got Hit Monkey coming up, even though that's yeah. been out in the States since last year. Buck Wild is having a, what, two-month gap yeah. between it? Uh, yeah. It's ridiculous. Uh, Disney really does need to square up on this. Mm. Yeah. So there we go. So that was kind of, that was, again, some of the news of the week. Like I said, there was, there was quite a little bit of it. There was definitely a much, bit more... Um, but let's now shift over just to some of the new content that's arrived. And before we get into um, turnovers or anything like that, just doing a quick shout out to our Patreons and YouTube channel members. Thank you so much for your support. So these are in the gold tier and above. So big thank you to Dana, Ricky, Baba, Dave, Adam, Mohammed. We've also got Ben, Raphael. My VCR still works. We got uh, Bina, Joshua, Dawn, Martin, Jeremy, Sarah. And we've also got um, Andrew, Elliot, Jacob, Caleb, Red Mars, Man, Aero G. Andrew, Cody, Darren, and Lauren, and also a huge thank you for your support, Sarah, at the, uh, the deluxe package. So, there, yeah, just thank you again for all of your support. What this does mean is you can take part on our weekly Q&As, which you can find us on live on um, Sunday nights. So you can submit questions. You can also join in with the live chat. You're also just basically just helping with um, supporting the channel paying for our software that we need to use for this, you know, paying for our hosting fees and everything. You know, it, it does all cost um, money to make. So if you could support us from as little as $2 a month, that would be amazing. Right. Now that's done, let's now talk. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I met your father. So this one's going to be coming to Hulu in the United States this coming week, um, next week. Um, it's going to be coming at some point to Disney Plus internationally. Um, it has been, we know it's coming. They've officially confirmed it. There was, but we don't know the date yet. Um, so I got to watch the first four episodes. I think you're just getting, I don't know if it's the first episode or, or the second in Hulu, and they're going to be released later. So did you watch How I Met Your F Father? I, uh, How You Met Your Mother. Your Mother, the original. Um, yeah. I saw a couple episodes here and there. It didn't really grab me. Um, I had some friends who were, who were mm. very into it and were quoting it all the time. So that's actually most of my exposure is from uh, quotes. Uh, it wasn't my thing. but No. See, I'm I'm a big I love sitcoms. You know, I I'm currently working my way through Seinfeld again. I'm just literally I think, like season eight. I've played through hundreds of episodes. Friends, Big Bang Theory, How I Met Your Mother was one I watched on and off. It wasn't one I kind of I think I stayed on with. Um, but I've been I think I recently got through like the first two seasons on Disney Plus um, when it dropped. So I and like New Girl and some other ones. So I watched this first uh, four episodes, and it was a little bit like, 
it feels like one of those shows. It feels very like 90s, 2000, you know, the gang come together and they're all hanging. And then they randomly put like, like, modern references to like unboxing videos and like you know they'd have like um trying to get the lighting you know i've got like these light rigs here you know and like referencing to like influences and stuff like that and it's like but there's a little bit like this all feels like quite old it's like 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 it was it feels like forced um so that was one issue i had with it there were some other issues um they kind of brought these this gang together because on the first episode they don't know each other and that's and you know they, they're all like they become friends, but it feels very forced because obviously, like with sitcoms, you kind of have that thing of you're supposed to really kind of be able to jump in at the on any episode at every given point, and you kind of know what's happening. You know, you know where everybody is. And by the end of the episode, everything like resets back to normal. You know, it's a standard. So by the second episode, they all just know each other and they're friends, and it's a kind of okay. Well, you've you've barely known, and that was a little issue. That technically, a couple of the characters were a little bit like, okay, where are they going with this one? They needed to flesh them out because that's the kind of problem sometimes with sitcoms. It, it takes like a season or two sometimes to get the characters flexed out a little bit. Um, and now I'm going to say this: there's this one character in it, and he is this rich British guy that comes over to America to to live with one of the girls, and he is the um, just his accent is so like stereotypical you know he's a, he's literally got a spoon around a silver spoon around his neck and That's you know subtle. he's just rich and doesn't know how to do anything hasn't got a job just you know and it, but his accent is just it's frustrating because it's it's literally just so fake and you know and i've listened i, I saw him the actor do like an ice bucket challenge from a few years ago so he's got a normal english accent so why not just let him do it rather than this really corny stereotypical cheesy accent that just it just feels like for me i'm just like oh, shut up this is horrible and it's really and that's distracting when you're at a point where you're like shut up it's like this is you know like if we had a, like a, a sitcom here and you had an american and they come in and, they, and it's so overly like cartoon you just be like no it doesn't fit and i just i know it's like you're going for an, a for an like american audience but it's like come on it's like that's the problem with the show is it it feels like a show from like 25 30 years ago but trying to be hip and yet you know friend you know like for today's generation like, today's generation is going to probably find this quite like old-fashioned but like we're gonna be looking and they're going well it's like too hip because they they it feels quite like you could watch it at six o'clock in the evening on, on a normal television channel and then they would like drop a random expression in like he's suddenly there like with this like vibrator thing and you're like why you could have like why are you doing this he it, it's like you're trying to be edgy but at the same time it's like why are you bringing that in now and it's like i don't know it it was just, it's a very strange, I, I I will carry on with the new episodes and see if it like beds in, but there's a few real bumps. Hilary Duff in it, it's fantastic. She's really good in it. Um, the, the other girl that's from grown, um, from grownish, she's really good in it, but it needs, a, it needs a little bit of work. It needs to try and work out what it wants to do because it is a sequel to how I met your fa mother. But it's kind of its own little thing. But it, it, I don't know quite what generation it wants to sit in. Is it like an, uh, is it like a ninety sitcom or is it today? And it's quite odd. So, so first of all, it sounds like we should get that um, English teacher from Big Shot oh, God, over yeah. here, and we'll hook her up with the British yes. guy, and they can get married, and we can never hear from them again. Jolly good, and all that. Off we go. Yeah. <laughs> right, moving on. Um, <laughs> I can't, I can't even do this bad this bad how bad this accent is it's just horrible it's always horrifying and entertaining in like kind of a car crash spectacle way seeing how other cultures portray your culture in their media yeah. as an american um you know you'll see americans portrayed in uh, like howdy partner how are you doing there folks <laughs> pretty, pretty much <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it's great seeing them in like Asian media, especially uh, South yeah. Korean or Japanese. Uh, Chinese is, is just, like yeah. completely out there. There's, they have no respect for us at all, which is you know, whatever. Um, yeah, it, it's it's interesting. I always kind of wonder how people in South America and Mexico and stuff feel about how how those countries get portrayed in American media. Yeah. Like, it's all just like uh, here's the yellow filter, so you know yeah. you're in Mexico. Anyway, 
um, the the main point, completely switching yeah. subjects here, is that how I met your father. Obviously, I've not seen it. Yeah. Um, it sounds like it's in that same field as all these other like modern remakes of of um, of well loved classics like uh, yeah. Doogie, Kami yeah. Aloha, um, you know the various ones over on the Disney Channel. It's a bit better than that. Like, what, it what is, is better than that. <laughs> yeah. What is the audience here, right? You know, um, are you going for the nostalgia angle? In which case, you're trying to get people who watch the original show. Yeah. Or are you trying to get new kids? Because the new kids don't have the nostalgia, right? No. You know, you put them in front of Doogie Kami Aloha, and they're like, wait, why is she called Doogie? What's Doogie Hauser? Yeah. You know, in, unless you have gone out of your way to expose your kids mm. to the Doogie Hauser show, they'd be like, I don't know who this is. I don't know why she's called Doogie. What's, it's a silly yeah. name. And, Literally, and you apply this, that yeah. to almost all of these shows. Literally, with this show, if you took out the first little bit where Kim Cattrall is telling you of this is a story about how I met your father. And then suddenly like it could be any sitcom. It could be a brand new sitcom. There is no there's literally if you take that little bit out, it could be a brand new sitcom. And it could be called XYZ or whatever. It, it's almost like having this having this how I met your father like gimmick shoved on it. It's like it's oh well, it's, it's different. It is completely different. There is there is no connection to it. It's a different characters. This it is a sequel in the fact that it's it's all different. But in some ways, like well, why not just do something new? Or you could have you could have had the same characters in an, and people might go, oh, it's a little bit like How I Met Your Father, but or you know you remember whatever. But it's I don't know. It just feels a little bit like you actually had a really good basics for a ba a, a good solid um, you know sitcom if you just kind of maybe didn't just shoehorn in it's also as well it's too i think we're too close to the original series i mean i think it only ended like six seven years ago it's still too new i mean if they maybe they did in 10 years time they might have been a little bit like oh yeah we're rebooting but you know it just doesn't feel like it's time to do a reboot on a show that's just literally most people's minds just ended they're probably just trying to strike while the iron's hot. Yeah. Um, I probably would have picked a different franchise in general, though, because if I remember correctly, the the finale for How I Met Your Mother didn't go over yeah. all that well. No. I, I no. remember people being very upset with it. Uh, it. It's one of those things that they've got a franchise or, or something they want to franchise. They want to capitalize on a familiar name, but they haven't quite figured out how. And that's not specific to mm. Disney. The, this is a uh, an entire industry thing mm. where people have not yet figured out how to capitalize on these. And I'm going to go out and say, probably stop trying. If you had mm -hmm. called this something else and maybe gone with, it is a How I Met Your Mother style show yeah. rather than explicitly making it a, a direct reference to it, you might get more goodwill out of it. It's kind of one of those weird things because on, on a whole, it, it's, it's, I, didn't, I didn't dislike the episodes. I watched the four episodes. And I was like, I'm going to watch the rest of the season. It's like, it's fine. It's a good easygoing comedy it's better than you know most of the other stuff but they had it, you know you're kind of like yeah but you other than the british guy you know if i took the british guy out of it it's like it's fine but did we need it kind of thing it's it, it's definitely worth checking you know i would say to anyone with a hulu subscription watch the, an episode or two give it a couple episodes you are going to need to give it but don't go in expecting it to be how i met your uh, mother because for me not having Barney in it, kind of, that he was my character that I, there's no one like that in it, which kind of, I felt was the funny bit. And But other than that, it, it's 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 okay. It's just very, very average. It really is just average. But Hilary Duff is great in it. And now I, I did watch and kind of think, well, she put, actually, I can see why everyone might have liked, liked to, for this Lizzie McGuire reboot, because I think that could have been alongside oh. of what this is. And, and I think that was, going back to the issue, like, mm. Hillary Duff really wanted the, the 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 reboot to be about her character, about where her character ended up, which of course meant they were going to have to talk about some fairly mature topic because mm -hmm. she's an adult now. Yeah. Um, and Disney probably really wanted it to remain a kids show, which means it's about other characters and and she's almost a side character in her mm -hmm. own series. And I can totally understand why they were at odds and why she would have wanted yeah. to. To do it that way and honestly if they had let her do it the way she had wanted to do it it potentially could have mm -hmm. been 
an example on how to do these things yeah. uh, to hit the right target audience. We will obviously never know. Uh, I, I would be surprised, even if the episodes that did get finished ever ever yeah. appear um, yeah. for our, for water consumption. Um, but yeah, I can I can totally understand that. But you did raise a, another good point. I want to talk about a lot of these sitcoms, uh, the ones that we remember, the mm -hmm. ones that we hold fondly. They often have that one or two particular character who really make it stand out for how I yeah. met your mother was definitely Barney uh, going back yeah, to Kramer. Kramer. Cause that was, that was yeah. Neil Patrick Harris. Um, but yeah, you know, he, he Seinfeld, yeah. uh, you know, back in the day b before certain things came out, Kramer was yeah. like an iconic character. On Joey would be like friends would be like, you know, you had that kind of the, the comedy, yeah. you know, the doofus kind of thing that kind of make you laugh. And yeah, this one doesn't really have that one, but, it, not not all comedies have have well, them, but it but it, it goes back to your original point too. There's normally a couple of episodes, if not a couple of seasons, for it to find its voice. Like you go back yeah. to the original Seinfeld, you might yes, be affectionate. Right. You, you you might be affectionate for the characters because you know where their arcs eventually take them. But you look at it and you're like, uh, Jason Alexander's character is like nothing like I remember him because the he hadn't yet figured out what the character was. Elaine is very different because she hasn't figured out yet what the character is, and it's not just sitcoms. This is, this is very true of uh, shows in general that that are starting from from scratch. But no, it's it's, it's def I definitely would say you know give it a go if you if you like the, if you like sitcoms, give it a whirl. It, it, it's definitely worth it. Hopefully, we'll get a, a release date soon for Disney Plus. Um, at some point, it would be nice to get that one confirmed. Don't know why Disney aren't pulling the trigger on that one just yet, but nevertheless, um, let's now talk. Um, we're going to talk about Eternals, which dropped onto Disney Plus this past week. Um, we realized we actually didn't talk about it when it came out because I think um, we had something going on that week. Um, so I watched it again this week, um, and it's that kind of thing of like watching it back and going, "This is a really well. It, it's probably the best looking Marvel movie they made." Um, I think Chloe Zhao. I mean, the 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 look of it, the colors, the tones, the way they look at each other and stuff. It, it looks really good. Some of the I thought like some of the fight scenes, you know, with the. I mean, my wife did say, well, "Are they Transformers?" Because <laughs> it's kind of gave off a little bit of that vibe of um, like the Transformer fights. Um, yeah, it. Um, yeah, my wife didn't. She actually got up before it ended and was like, oh, "I've had enough of this." Um, it's definitely, it's kind of funny as well in, the, in like our Facebook group. There's a real kind of, there's a lot of trend of kind of going, "Yeah, it's boring. I didn't like it." And I'm like, I watched it back again on Wednesday night. I'm like, "Oh, I, I, I think this is fine. I, I, I enjoyed it. I don't know how often I'd watch it, but I'm quite happy to go see where these characters go. I, it held my attention the second time around. What about you?" I enjoyed it a bit more the second time around. Um, I'm not on the same level as your wife was on, <laughs> on it, like storming out of the theater or anything. But I, I was a bit disappointed with it the first time. Not to the same level that you know the the Metacritic score would make you think. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's probably in a solid like high six, low seven range. But um, there were things that bothered me about it, and uh, we'll get to those in a minute. I did want to agree though, um, in terms of like cinematography, framing, color usage, sound usage, the soundtrack's mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, it, it looks like nothing else in the Marvel universe. And mm -hmm. they did a great job of really separating it out. It's got vibes of like 2001, a space odyssey and, and other kind of mm -hmm. more introspective sci-fi, or at least it tries to be, I think that's, yeah. that's the key word. It tries to be. And in some cases, it gets there. Like the the opening is great. Uh, mm -hmm. You're really kind of just like overwhelmed with the spectacle of it. And then, and then it kind of starts to lose its way. And this is yeah, where I think yeah. most people start to lose it. For me, um, for example, I think it's Dane, the guy that's going to end up becoming like Black Knight. Completely irrelevant. It's just totally irrelevant. Doesn't he? Doesn't need to be there at all. They could have done that whole. He didn't even need to be in this movie at all. They, and I actually feel like they would have better off not having him and introducing him in his own movie because he was completely just pointless. He was, a, uh, yeah. So this is the thing. It's not just Dane though. Uh, Dane, of course, being, uh, will eventually be the Black Knight yeah. and, and played by Kit Harrington from Game of Thrones. Um, it's not just him. There are many points in this movie where you're kind of going, what is this plot point trying to do? Mm. And, and then they never come back to it or, 
or they resolve it in an unsatisfying way. And I think that is the core problem with the movie is you've got many of these different, uh, let's call them Dane mm. plot points where you're like, okay, you're clearly setting something up, but you're not getting to it in this movie. Um, I also, and, and I, also frustrating. Yeah. I also feel like there was too many of them. They could have done with trimming a couple yeah. of them. Um, maybe like the guy that can control people's minds of like, well, he's pointless. He just doesn't, you know, yeah. While he's he was needed for the main finish, his power, he was a he was a pretty awful character. That I actually re, I really like the guy. Um, you know, he's got the big fists. I mean, I thought his character was really fun. Yeah, Gil, um, and it's like I would have liked him to carry on. But again, again, his character could you not have merged that in with one of the other ones and the, that kind of the issue really? I think this is the other core issue here, um, and I. When I was talking with a friend, I kind of described it this way, which is, uh, I realize it's going to be kind of oxymoronic, but it's both too long of a movie and too short of a movie. Mm. It's too long. It's one of the longest runtimes in the MCU, and it really probably should have been about 15 to 20 minutes shorter. But even with the runtime that it has, it does not have enough time to explore all the stories that it should. Mm. Uh, I agree with you. It probably should have had less, fewer, fewer characters, uh, merge a couple of them, and spend more time with them because I think the best moments in the movie are one where we're just spending time with the characters. You know, yeah, uh, that dinner at Gilgamesh's house. Yeah, lovely. You know, I love just that. kind of bantering. Uh, they're on the the plane, and and you know he's doing his uh, documentary, and he's showing how. I, that, uh, I love. I did love, see his character. His character was the one I probably was like. I really enjoyed him. I, I was at Gilgamesh. Yeah, I thought he was fun, but the the, the but like. Sprite was just annoying, um, just didn't need to really be there. Um, well, because they obviously got rid of her for the next episode for the next movie. <laughs> <They're really good. laughs> I, I don't think she's totally gone. I think what'll end up happening is they'll probably recast her as an older character because now she's human, yeah. so she'll grow up a little bit. But the thing is, you can see where she would have had a very interesting character arc, but they they had the starting point. And they had the ending point, which is, of course, her being frustrated that she's never yeah. growing up, that she's never gets to be an adult, even though she is thousands of years old. Yeah. And there's no middle to it. You never get the build from beginning point to end point, mm. right? Uh, but you can see how there could have been a good story in there if they'd taken the time to explore it. And this is you can do this for every single one of the Eternals. Mm. It's that, again, I think it's a thing of trying to do, trying to have too many at once. Of overstuffing with, they said if they cut two or three of the characters and they're or you know, I mean, yeah, I think that was definitely an issue with this one. I mean, like this whole things of it, I, I definitely, I, I don't think it's a bad movie. I, I think it's getting a lot of unnecessary hate on it. Like, oh, what's the point? You know, like it's pointless. It's not. I mean, I love the whole big ending with the big with the big. Like big, like I mean, it, it, in terms of like how it changes the Marvel. I mean, if we're all sat here now and it's great big, like, but then by this point, we've all had half the population wiped out. We've had aliens attacking us. We've got superheroes flying around all over the place. I think we're probably at a point where, oh, it's just a Tuesday. <laughs> There's a giant palm coming out of the ocean. Well, she's, you know, someone will deal with it. Um, <laughs> but if, I think this is the, I think this is the big thing. Um, this is a movie that potentially could become much better in retrospect. Yeah. You know, this is a movie that is setting up a lot of things and depending on what they do with those things, uh, this could become better because it's laying the groundwork for interest, potentially interesting stories. The, mm. the eternal storyline, uh, the, the celestial storyline, we've got Star Fox and, and, um, Pip showing up in one of the post credit sequences. Blade. Huh? Blade. Blade. Blade, yeah, yeah. So, uh, what, uh, the, I, the, the Ebony Blade, yeah. No, no, Blade is in here. This is the thing. The, his his voice is the one that caused the kit at the end. Oh, and, that, uh, see, I thought that was the Watcher, actually. Okay. See, I actually, I only found it out on the internet. That's how bad that is as a debut of, like, most of us didn't even know who he is. And that's, I, but that's, I, that's, I, that's actually yeah. Blade making his debut. Okay, all right, yeah, I, that, that totally <laughs> Uh, but that's but that's bad to me. That's a bad um they and it was just I just felt like that whole thing was just unnecessary. It just his whole arc was just totally Yeah, I don't know. It would have maybe, you know, had him turn up in the scene and go, Hello, I'm Kit and you know, I'll show you around the uni around the university and you know, we see him later on. But I don't know. That was my one but overall, I mean, I really like Icarus. I thought he was a really interesting like and I like the little nods to, to like Superman and 
Batman and you know Alfred and stuff and like having a bit of fun with it. I thought that was fun. Well, I mean, this is the Justice League. Uh, they, they, they never explicitly stated, but this is the Justice League. It's just the Marvel version of it. Uh, normally, as well as you got, yeah, Flash. Well. It's, 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 <laughs> when, you, when you sit down and think about it, you're like, oh yeah, this is Justice League. Normally, the Marvel version of the Justice League is the Squadron Supreme, but yeah. the Eternals are also modeled after them. Mm. Um, and this is the story that DC wanted to imply: the the Superman goes evil storyline. Mm. What happens when when Superman goes evil? Uh, I don't think they came up with a satisfactory actor. I'm talking about Marvel in this case. Yeah. Marvel did not come up with a satisfactory answer any more than DC did. But yeah, uh, there's some interesting bits to it. Uh, there's a lot of interesting groundwork, which may mm -hmm. or may not come to fruition later in uh, n later in phase five or phase six even. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to see where it goes before we can really kind of ultimately lay judgment on this one. But at the moment, as a standalone movie, I think it's it's an interesting experiment. It's absolutely worth watching. Um, but yeah, it's not one of the better ones right now. I think a lot yeah. of the negativity, though, is it is a Marvel movie. So people you know, have very high expectations for it. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I thought Angelina Jolie's character, Fina, was really good. I thought she was really I love the whole aspect of her like almost going mad because all her memories are coming back. I, I thought that was a really good I, um, aspect. I think that actually comes through better on the second watch too, when you know yeah. that she she's getting memories of the previous incarnations and and her warnings aren't just her going crazy. It's actually her mm. trying to to come to terms with things that they've already done. Yeah. So I I, I thought you know that was good. and um I also really enjoyed the fact of and I can't remember the character, but the flash, you know, with her being deaf um because I've seen her in like Walking Dead and stuff and I just I really like her you know her doing sign and uh, I thought that was cool. I really liked a little bit of fun with a bit of flash and their fight scene, you know, that big fight scene on the beach. I really enjoyed that. I, I thought that worked really well with Icarus, a kind of this big fight where the other characters suddenly got a little, you know, like the smart guy, he had all his tech to kind of take him down and she's beating the heck out of him. And yeah, I like that because they finally got their chance to shine. Um, yeah, so I, I, I enjoyed it. I really, I mean, I, I think at the time, I think I put me like an eight out of 10 because as far as I'm concerned, I'm like this is a good movie. This is a this is this is a really good movie. It's just it's a little bit different. They go a little. They it's a different tone. It's a different speed. It's a different pace. And I kind of like it. It's a little bit more grown up. So for me, I I'm thinking of it as like a decent to good movie. So mm -hmm. it's still it's still a good movie that could have been a great movie with just a couple of small changes, maybe a fewer fewer characters. And let some of the story breathe a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I actually want to talk about that that fight scene on the beach really, really quickly because this I think illustrates it really well. Mm -hmm. um, and we're actually going to go over to Angelina Jolie's character yeah. here because you know this is also the culmination of the deviant fight. You know, the, yeah. nominally the main bad guy until we realize they're not actually mm -hmm. the main bad guys. There's a whole story through the first half of the movie with the deviants hunting them down mm -hmm. and and you know characters getting killed, actual yeah. important characters getting killed, and there's an and there's this loss, they never really get a chance to, to properly mourn that loss. Mm. And then you get to this fight scene on the beach and Angelina's character gets splintered off and she's going to fight the deviant, um, even mm. though we have pretty much at this point even forgotten the deviant exists because he's no longer the bad guy. And, you know, they, they have a, a quick fight and she slices the deviant up. Uh, mm. You know, she, she gets her revenge. She gets to avenge her best friend, possibly lover, depending on how you want to yeah. read it. But we don't get to savor that moment, to, to savor her victory, because we immediately go to the beach fight and we're right back in the middle of the fight. Yeah. And then her plot just again. kind of disappears for the rest of the movie. And this, I think, is what encapsulates the main problem with the movie. You never get to you never get a moment to comprehend what's going on. Because mm -hmm. the second something happens, they move immediately to something else. Uh, and and if we had had even just a little bit of time with Angelina to mm -hmm. To recognize what has just happened, either uh, despair that her friend is now truly gone, or some triumph because she avenged him, or something. Just you, you just need a little something there to kind of close the loop on the story, and we never get it. 
it's also this is where I think like with Selma Hayek's character where she dies, but because we keep seeing it so much in flashbacks, you actually it neglects like, oh, she's gone because you, you've seen her more after she's died than before. Um, so it didn't have to say, I don't know. I, I still think it was, I still think it's a greedy, solid movie. I think I like the fact that it was different. And I think that was, I think, you know, so what we keep saying about Marvel of it just feeling, you know, trying to do something different and you're going to give them credit for trying something and not keep going back to the well of, you know, and, and it is, you know, the thing is, you know, it's so easy to overstuff movies, especially Marvel with so many characters. And I still feel like, you know, if they take in, I don't know, I'm trying to think, you know, if maybe the smart guy and the guy that can um, read people or can control people, if they took them out. Maybe, I mean, even the Bollywood guy, um, he didn't really do a lot. I mean, I liked, I thought he was one of the best in there. But he didn't, and I like the fact that I've been playing this thing. I really thought he added a bit of humor to it and a bit of humanization. Um, but again, he didn't really have anything to do in the last final. He, he didn't even fight Icarus. No, uh, but he, he did have some of the cooler powers. Yeah. And honestly, his, I, I can't remember his assistant's name, but oh, his great. assistant was one of the highlights of this movie. <laughs> his assistant was fantastic. I want to see more of this guy. I really hope that yeah. they keep using him. Um, Honestly, more than anything, that's what it boils down to. I mm. do want to see more of these characters. Uh, I would love to see what some of these characters were up to in between, mm. uh, you know, the fights in Babylon and then the modern fight. I'd love to see where they get to where they're at. I'd love to see where they go from here. And I think that that is, uh, yeah, that is the ultimate takeaway. Is I do want to see more of these yeah. characters. I want to see where this, where all the plot points they dropped end up. I am engaged with it. Yeah. Uh, it's just, they just slightly missed the mark of what I yeah. want for this movie. But as you said, I also want Marvel to continue experimenting. It, mm. it Experimenting means sometimes it won't quite get the way you want it to, but you need to do it you, to keep yeah. the Marvel Universe from getting stale. And also, uh, I think we both agree, this is not nearly uh, the, the failure that the internet would want you uh, I mean, I, I, I generally like to look at this. I mean, this is, you know, a massive big, you know, I still think it's, you know, it's better than like, you know, Dark World or it's nowhere near that territory of, of like, it's a solid movie. It's just a slap bang in the middle. It's just not. And I think maybe that's the thing as well. Of maybe, you know, how you go into it of like, do you want a bit more story or do you want a bit more, you know, it's, the only thing that really did annoy me, and this is something about Disney Plus, was the IMAX version. Um. <laughs> it kept jumping between like widescreen and IMAX. Now I don't remember that with Shang-Chi. I think the whole movie was in IMAX and, but with, it kept jumping and it was quite distracting. Um, especially when it was sometimes even within a scene, it's like, well, surely you should have done the whole fight in it rather. And it's like, if you're going to do the IMAX, it's like we need the whole movie. It's in it for the whole movie. Not this like how I don't, it was really annoying. It was quite frustrating kind of flipping between it. It, at least keep scene consistency. Uh, it is fairly traditional in Hollywood to only film like the biggest scenes in IMAX. I know that's how they yeah. did it with The Dark Knight, uh, which was one of the, the yeah. precursor IMAX movies. Uh, it, it, only certain scenes are caught within IMAX. And I think that's because the IMAX cameras are so yeah. expensive. And uh, there's a lot of scenes you can't shoot with IMAX because you can't um, miniaturize <laughs> the technology enough to get it into some scenes that you would want. Um, but yeah, I agree. They, they, I appreciate that they're including this in Disney Plus. I think that is fantastic. I want to see more of it. Um, the technology will improve. The, I think that's the main. Yeah. I think it's only because I on my big screen TV, when it's an IMAX mode, I love it. And I, this is the thing: is I, you know, I thought that was Shang Chi. Of it filled the screen up. It felt like I was watching it on a bigger screen because it's like you know, I'm already on a big TV, and then it feels even bigger because you've. And then I think like Return is like you've got these great scenes, and then suddenly it flicks. And that was my one issue with Disney Plus. Of like, could we? A little bit, but if they didn't film it like that, it's a bit maybe with um, obviously Shang Chi was filmed what nearly a year before or a year after Eternals because Eternals was sat on a shelf for like eighteen months. Um, yeah, that was that was my only little little issue with the Disney Plus version. Well, let me let me flip that and give a, a positive on the Disney Plus. I don't remember this for Shang Chi, but I I did notice it with the Eternals um, when you get to the credits. You know, yes. they show the scene, and then a little button popped up. Yes. In the <laughs> Hits the credits and go straight to the second, and I was like, "That was oh, that I was like fantastic. <laughs> that was that was fantastic because that was I, great. I did the same thing. It was just like, oh, 
because I like the you obviously had the good credits, the bit that's a bit more interesting, and then it just goes to the strip. And I did, yeah. So that was a good, good little thing. Yeah, I, and I, in the back of my head, I was like, oh, this would have made the the second end scene from uh, No Way Home much more tolerable. <laughs> I, I, I know No Way Home is not going to be on Disney Plus for a very long time, but still, I was like, uh, yeah, can I get this in the theater, please? Yeah. I, not to take away from the people, it is a very big deal to get your name in the credits. But yeah. let's be honest, most people, especially on Disney Plus, just like fast forward, fast forward, fast forward. Well, you're not, you're not really sitting there making a note of everyone. Hmm, Bob and Jeff and Bob. <laughs> Unless you know somebody in the production, you're not really yeah. paying too much attention. No. Um, okay, so let's now shift over to our last topic for the episode. So that's going to be talking about the chapter three of the book of Boba Fett, which dropped on Wednesday. Um, a nice. I enjoyed this episode. There was a few issues I had with it, but generally as a whole, enjoyed it. Thought it was fun. Um, I like the fact that it was more set in today rather than set in the um, the flashback. You know, they kind of limited that what they were doing. Um, I, yeah, I'm really enjoying this series. I, I'm not quite seeing. I it seems a little bit more lukewarm from the general reaction I'm seeing, but I'm enjoying it. I, I'm really not kind of. There's a few issues I had with the the mopeds. Um, yeah, we'll come back to the mopeds. <laughs> we'll come, talk about the mopeds in a bit because that's really kind of got the internet rattled up. Um, but I enjoyed it. I thought it was a nice, solid episode. Um, I like the whole thing with the story being told of him coming back and then finding all the the raiders have all been killed by the biker gang, which he kind of caused by had he not have intervened, that everything would have been fine. Um, but that's just us looking at it through logic. Um, I thought that then set that up quite nicely. Then him like why he's left them. Because they aren't there anymore, so I like that whole aspect. I like. I did actually like him dealing with all the problems with the town now, of like you know the crime lords aspect, and hiring the kids. Because that, that's a matter of thing. Yeah, you've really not got anyone to fight for you. You need a group, and I actually thought that made a lot of sense in dealing with the water person. Um, you know that kind of thing made a little bit more better. Yeah, I thought of a, overall, I thought it was a. I'm re, I am enjoying this series. I'm, I, I think I'm enjoying it much more than a, a Hawkeye. Um, when I'm watching, no, I, it. I, I definitely would not say that for myself. But I am. Mm-hmm. I am overall enjoying the series now. Yeah, I have no idea what the internet is saying about this. I'm other than uh, one coworker who I talk mm-hmm. about it with. I have absolutely no idea what people are thinking about this series. So it's kind of interesting <laughs> to hear about. Um, but I, that said, I, I think I am falling in kind of the lukewarm camp on mm-hmm. this one. This was a better episode overall, I think, um, particularly because it was focusing on things that were interesting. It was the, uh, I'm going to say administrative, which, of course, makes it sound like it's not interesting, but actually try, fleshing out this town, fleshing out Mosespa, and figuring out Boba Fett's place into it uh, was much needed. Mm-hmm. Getting to meet some of these other characters, having them flesh out a little bit more was very important. Uh, and overall, those bits, I think, were much better and, and well needed. And it really does kind of start moving us towards the next phase of the story, yeah. which does look like it's going to be very interesting. And yeah, the last two weeks, I've been kind of like, this Tuscan story is stupid. Uh, the, the, the twist on it that you mentioned here, that the Tuscan village has been mostly wiped out, uh, it... it actually makes this story more interesting. Now, it's unfortunate mm. for the Tuscans, but uh, we have moved from this idolized version of what the wastes look like and into the, oh, yeah, um, there are consequences for your actions, uh, mm. sometimes very big consequences. So I'm, I am now, finally, after three inter- three episodes, interested in seeing where the rest of that story is going. Yeah. But also, I mean, the whole thing with the, the bikers was a, a lot of people, I, I mean... I there's a few things. First off, the the look of the bow peds caught a lot of people. They didn't like it being colorful. They felt like it shouldn't have belonged on like Tatooine. And I'm I'm like, well, kids I, would like teenagers would have you know they don't and not everything on Tatooine has to be brown. You know they're obviously rebelling about something and they like tech and they want to be on course. So I don't have a problem with the colors. It just looks so slow. I mean, it looked like the slowest chase scene. Um, in this, I mean, it just, uh, I don't know. I'm trying to, I have something that's like, you know, like jumping on like go karts on, um, or on a, like a golf cart and riding around. It just felt so slow. Now, now I'm just picturing the one of the kids pulling out like a blue shell and, <laughs> and chucking it Mario style. Right, let's come back to the, the, the chase in a second. I actually want to talk about yeah. the mopeds themselves really, really quickly. I like the idea of it. I like the idea of these kids having this obsession and, you know, 
um, especially here in the States, people can get really obsessive over their cars and they can mm. overly detail. There's a whole subculture of like street racing and, and such uh, legality of which we won't bother going into. Uh, so I can understand these kids who have basically nothing else, just kind of putting everything into these bikes and, and making them super flashy. Well, just on that, I mean, my town, I mean, I'm on a seaside town here. Every like Wednesday night, there will be thousands of motorbikes coming together to park up on the seafront. And it's a thing every single week. You know, it's quite a common, you know, big, big groups of them. You know, you get your Vespers, you know, you get, there's a Vespa group that come together. You got like your moped, you have like your, um, so I, maybe for me, I'm like, well, yeah, mo I've seen so much motorbikes and stuff like with that. I, I didn't have a problem with that. Um, so that didn't, so it just like, yeah, well, why wouldn't they? That kind of makes sense. Yeah, up. no, but I, I totally get that angle on it, which is that, you know, these kids have nothing else. They're, they're hyper focusing on the mm -hmm. one thing they can control in their lives. And, that, and that's something I think that's relatable. The only problem I have with the mopeds, other than the chase, which we'll come to in a second, is that, again, this is Tatooine and those bikes are pristine. Yeah. Uh, now, I get that the car owners and uh, not car owners, but but people who love their cars, they take absolutely yeah. meticulous care. I used to work next to a guy who, after it rained, would immediately be outside uh, wiping down his car so that the droplets like wouldn't affect the car in any way, shape or form. But this is Tatooine. Yeah. There's only so much TLC you can give to a car to make it look that shiny and sparkly. But I was watching a documentary about Dubai last night, and they had um, a big group of women that have uh, supercars. And they are driving through the desert, and the cars are crystal clean, you know, and they're all bright colors, bright, bright green, bright yellow. So I was like, well, yeah, so <laughs> I would go, well, actually. <laughs> all right, all right. I'll, I'll grant you that. I mean, it, the. If they've got nothing else to do, then yeah, sure, those, those cars. I, but it is a style clash with yeah, what we've yeah. got, and and it's more than just the mopeds. It's the characters themselves, the way they're dressed, the way that they are like immaculate, and it kind of is at odds with. Well, these kids, they don't have the money, even to buy water, so they're stealing the water. But they look like rich kids out on having a little like yeah. fun in the streets kind of thing, and it doesn't, it doesn't quite gel up. Hmm. Uh, and, and then, of course, it goes into the chase, which was just absolutely ridiculous. It, it's it just, so slow, wasn't it? It just didn't it was, have any... It was slow. It wasn't exciting. It was using weird camera shots. Like, it was using hyper zooms and things like that. You're like, what is going on here? I mean, it's like, you know, go up the ramp and jump. It's like, this. it just, it just felt lazy. I don't know. It, it's not even lazy. It just felt just cheap and it just it didn't have any essence of speed because i always think of like speeders like you know from return of the jedi of, right and this was like chugga 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 <laughs> well, there, there was there was like, that scene with the 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 palaquin or not the palaquin but the you know the, the person on was drawing the the speeder with the two aliens yeah. in it and and he tries to dash across the street just like <laughs> this is this is Austin Powers. This is like, you know, you should not try to cross the street or you're just going to stand there. Uh, you know, it's the steamroller with the guy standing there yeah. screaming for like five minutes, like stop. And you're like, just step out of the way. Just, just two steps to your right. You're good. And it, that's this entire chase scene of, mm. of random people in the streets, just standing there and go, they can see it coming a mile away. <laughs> Come through like the fruits, the fruit stall, and all. It's I like, know. oh, why are we doing this? <laughs> and then the actors aren't doing anything to sell it, which is no. a problem. Uh, it's actually okay. Uh, I want to kind of segue that to the to the Twilight, the guy that they were chasing. Of course, yes. there is something off about that character, and I'm not talking about like within the story universe, because mm -hmm. there is something off about the character in the story universe. I'm kind of leaning towards he's actually the real power. Yeah. in Mos Espa. But no, I'm talking about the actor in this case. The way he has decided to play this character is very distracting. I, and I can't really put my finger on why, but any any scene he's in, I'm just like... I, you kind I of half expect him to, It's like, yeah. you know, like if, it's like a... Almost like, can he catch a kind of like twirling your, your, your moustache yeah. kind of thing? Yeah, I don't know. Hey, but... I don't know. It's it's definitely an interesting. It's an interesting series. I'm I am enjoying it. I am. There's obviously the chase is the only thing I didn't really think that was that good about it. But I love the fact of like uh, BK just 
pulling Boba Fett out of out of the tank because he knew that was coming at some point because this guy keeps going in his tank and sleeping. He's very vulnerable with the window wide open. Yeah. Um, it actually, kind of raises the point of like everybody can see this coming, but but why the heck did you not set up defenses <laughs> at all? You're supposed to be like the best bounty hunter in the galaxy. <laughs> Why are you just sitting in a tube completely defenseless when you know you are completely defenseless and there's this giant Wookiee trying to hunt you? Yeah, but he's he's cool now. I love him. Um, and also, we've got to say, I love the thing when they brought the Rancor in and they're going to train him. The message about him, I want to ride it. It's like, we know that's coming up in the finale. He's going to ride in with a Rancor to beat whoever he's going to be beating up on a Rancor. And I'm here for it. I'm in on it. I want it. Obviously, he made a little bit of a reference to being on a bigger beast, which is a reference to the um, the holiday special. And I don't know if you can quite see it. Um, it's on the other side. I literally have down here my ninety my rancor oh, yeah, from the yeah. from, from the nineteen eighties, right on the shelf here. That's like from from one of my old classic Star Wars figures. I'm sure there's a few droids and Yoda and a few other figures inside of it. But I love the the rancor is just like one of them things for me. Return of the Jedi is still that movie that I just connected with as a kid because I would have been about I was like three or four when it came out, so I was the right age for it. Um, but yeah, it's definitely for me. I love that whole scene, and you know it's coming, and you can see the setup coming a mile away. But I'm, I'm I can't wait for it. <laughs> I, I honestly was just like, I'm enjoying Danny Trejo being in this. Uh, yeah, you know, being the the rancor tamer is like. I love watching you. You're such an entertaining, fun actor to watch. And I love just the crazy stuff you do. He doesn't say no to anything. So he just ends up in all sorts of random stuff. He's like, uh, he was in Spy Kids and and then he's in like Machete. And you're like, okay. Uh, well, I think it's, I think because obviously Roger Rodriguez uh, directed oh, yeah, this of course. episode. But also, I think this is the fact that, like, you know, that, like, Boba goes off and he just turns to the rank and goes, he'll be back. Like, like I say to my dog. Yeah, <laughs> it's no, just no, kind no, of just like, no, I love no, that no, whole aspect no. of it. Uh, and, and you know, there there is going to be a Boba Fett riding a Rancor toy um, uh, probably the week after episodes, the, the yeah. last episode drops. Yeah. Um, I did, did have a little bit of a problem with them kind of like softening the Rancor a bit. I mean, the, the name is Rancor. It literally means just like, unparalleled rage but um, doesn't but we kind of already seen that a bit in the um like the boba F in the some of the animated series of yeah, them it, training them the clone wars and then of course he makes yeah. reference to the the witches of dathomir which of course featured quite heavily in the in the clone wars and and such and they do ride rancors so there is a precedence for it it mm. i think it's more of a culmination of things yeah. in this series though you know um We've softened the Tuscan Raiders. We've softened the Gamoran, uh, the Green Pig Guard. They, they, they look too like tall. That. They still look too tall. They need to be about yeah, a foot shorter. That still bothers me. Um, <laughs> uh, and there's just been like a concentrated effort in this series uh, to to kind of soften Tatooine, and it it kind of is at odds with like you know, uh, you know you'll never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. Mm -hmm. That was Mos Eisley rather than Mos Espa, but still, uh, it. It's an odd choice. Mm. Uh, it it kind of doesn't feel right to soften Tatooine like that, at, at least no. to the degree that they are. But also as well, this is the, it's like because I've seen some other people. There was a bit of a comment I saw earlier today about the idea of Star Wars fans being upset that Boba Fett is being fleshed out. He's having, you know, we're seeing more about him. He's we're learning what he's about, his weaknesses, and going. Yeah, there was a, but he was full of mystique. Well, yeah, because he had six minutes of screen time in like form in like, so we never got to know him. Whereas this series is, it's kind of blown it wide open. I, I kind of get why they. It, I always thought Boba Fett would have been better off being a this being a. It feels like a different character, to be honest. I feel like I'm watching it almost like. A, you know, it's somebody completely different. It's they could have called this, you know, a, an entirely different Mandalorian guy, and we, it would have been fine. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what the Mandal that's what yeah, the Mandalorian. You know, was. Yeah. Um, uh, no, I, I I do agree with that point of view. It really does depend on how the fleshing out works, though. Like I, I constantly point out, the solo movie, as fun as it was, does not do the character any favors. It mm. does not do Han Solo any favors. Its mere existence does not do Han any any favors. We will have to wait to see how this ends out, if it ends up being a net positive for Boba Fett or not. But I do agree. Boba Fett was a perfect example of less is more. Mm. 
we mm -hmm. got to make up our own stories because we we didn't know what the stories were. Why does Darth Vader say no disintegrations? Why does Darth Vader actually seem to respect this guy when he spends literally the rest of the movie choking out everybody who makes a mistake? Mm -hmm. You know, that they're the mystique is the character in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. Now they could still end up in a situation at the end of the series where like, okay, I'm glad they made this series. We know so much more about him and he's such an interesting character in this form. But I also kind of agree with you. This is not the same Boba Fett that we got in Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. This is a very different character. This is again, a softer character. They have softened him up. They've mm -hmm. kind of given him that. You see it with the punks. It's like, oh, uh, I was, Respect. yeah, um, I was essentially contracted to take out these kids. And the Boba Fett in our heads would have just shot all the kids and been like, okay, yeah. job's done. Uh, I'll take my my tribute uh, as expected. And now this version's like, oh, actually, you know what? The water dealer is kind of a jerk. Why don't you guys come to work for me and I'll, I'll give you a good line. It's like, that doesn't necessarily line up with the Boba mm -hmm. Fett that's in our head. This happened in the old canon too. You know, the, the, the stuff that no longer counts. Boba Fett became kind of an uneasy ally good figure. He even trained one of the kids of, of uh, Han and Leia, things like that. It's it's kind of the downside of being such a popular character, right? You, you see yeah. this not just in Star Wars, but in, in all sorts of these kind of shows where one of the villain characters becomes very popular and like, man, he's so popular. We can't keep him as a villain and in the show because he's got to get defeated at some point. So we got to make him a good guy. And it, yeah, it, it can, that yeah. seems to be what we're going for here. Um, yeah, we, we've got to see where they end with this, but I do, at least in principle, agree with the idea that like maybe should have left him as a little bit more mystique character. Yeah, I, and I, the thing is, what I'm really hoping for is it's going to confuse the casual audience of when he turns up, maybe in like a soca with a white beard, and he's going to be like Rex, or something. <laughs> he's oh going to play God. like a completely different character, but it's the same one. You know, they go, they've got to do it. They've got to do it. So, at I some would point. love that. I would love for him to show up as Rex in the Ahsoka series. I mean, he's going to be really old at that point. Rex is going to yeah. be really old at that point, but we'll, <laughs> that would yeah. be good. But no. So there we go. So that is the book of Boba Fett. We'll have to know your thoughts on Chapter 3 as well as Eternals and anything else this week. We'll be back next week with another episode. Obviously, check out our live stream here on YouTube on Sunday night. And then obviously during the week, we'll have new episodes of the Disney Plus News uh, Monday through Friday with all of the Disney Plus News of the day. So on that note, guys, thank you very much. And we shall see you guys soon. Later. I'd like to thank all of our Patreon and YouTube channel members for their support. You can become a member from as little as $2 a month and you get access to our weekly Q&A and much more.